Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes, everyone. I feel kind of weird because I hear music and my brain automatically starts me like showing like to dance. That's horrible for me, but well. So welcome, everyone. Um, let me see if it works as I expect it to work. Yes. So welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Diane Martinez Alcantara. I am a sales engineer at Altrix. And yeah, exactly. And today's topic, I don't think it's totally unfamiliar to you. It's something that you have seen it on the media. I think a lot of organizations and also the government is working towards saving the bees. It's a real problem. And today I'm going to show you how you can use machine learning in combination with your spatial analysis to reduce the bee mortality. So I hope you enjoy it. If you have questions, I have a Q&A session at the end and we can uh, discuss further. Okay. I have the feeling that I have to go here directly to change the slide. Okay. For all the people who actually are not very familiar with pollinators, pollinators are actually the main part of the agricultural process. You might wonder, what are pollinators? Well, pollinators are those little insects that move pollen from the male flower to the female flower. And this actually, what it's doing is enabling the possibility to have fertilization and the creation of the seeds. Examples of pollinators, well, essentially would be the bees, of course. We have also butterflies, as well as wasps, and also flies. Right? Those are the examples. So it's important to mention this. Without pollinators, there is no agriculture possible. There is no way. Let me give you some facts. I have to go back, definitely. So let me give you some, some, some facts about the bees, right? Bees produce much more than honey. Bees are actually uh, responsible or they are the key for the food production. Right. Alone itself, as this diagram shows, they are responsible, in general, all the pollinators, all the insects, of producing a third percent of the food that we eat every day. Think about what you ate yesterday. Well, not the kebab, but think about, for example, zucchini, or think about vegetable or another fruit like apricot, oils that you can eat like canola, um, other things like spices like coriander, everything depends on these little insects, right? Just to give you um, an idea, in Europe, more than 4,000 different vegetables as well as fruits depend on these important tasks that the pollinators are doing. In general, um, if you have a look into a colony, these colonies, it's kind of difficult to say how many bees do we have, because inside of the colonies, you can find anything between 35,000 to 55,000. That's very extreme. That's difficult to calculate. But it's, what is possible to calculate is to know how many commercial honeybees available. And just to give you some idea about some data that I found that it's really, um, I, I cannot understand why we haven't react much, much earlier, right? It's about, for example, the amount of these commercial honeybee in Europe. At the year of 1985, compared with today, we have less, so 25% less commercial honeybee. In the US, it's nothing better. Since the year 2006 until now, they have produced 40% less honeybee. And then finally, in the UK alone, not even 10 years ago, so in 2010, we have lost 45%. That's enormous. So I think at this point, you will realize how hard is this uh, topic and how important it is that we start acting and seeing options for us to start saving the bees. Um, if we have a look into the mortality of the bees, since the late uh, 1990, beekeepers start alarming, getting alarmed because winter after winter, they would see that there are less bees and also less colonies. In total, this has been 20% have been 20% less uh, bees when I get together. 
There's 20% less bees than they, uh, they, they were today, right? And let's remember, Europe, there are a lot of countries in between. So you will find anything between 2% and 53%. So the numbers are alarming. So I get at this point, I have made clear how important the bees are, right? With bees, what we will get will be, we will produce much more food, as well as we will have a higher biodiversity of the plants. Without them, there will be less food, and of course, therefore, we will have a lower biodiversity of the plants. And believe me, you don't want to keep eating corn your whole life. Well, it's good, but you don't want to do that. Yeah? Ah, thank you very much. This. And the question is, why are these bees disappearing? That would be a really good question, right? So this is a phenomenon that is happening worldwide. But especially in the areas of North America and Europe, we have seen alarming numbers. There are three main reasons why globally the bees are disappearing. One of them is the industrial agriculture. The second one is all the parasites and patho pathogens that are inside of the colonies that are killing those bees. And the third one is the climate change, right? We are losing our biodiversity. What's happening is that we, and I, I, I include myself, right? We are supporting practices of monocultives, which for example, think about how many times you eat um, avocado. If you're eating avocado every day, that's actually not helping that much a lot of all the pollinators. Why? Because we eliminate all the nutrients, then they would, we wouldn't have forage, and therefore there is no food for the bees, right? And other uh, pollinators, right? And think about what the bees does. The bees, what they are actually doing, they are collecting the pollen from place to place, and they will bring it to the colony. What happens nowadays is that that pollen has a lot of chemicals, a lot of um, things that are actually not good for uh, for the whole colony. So they are bringing like an, something bad to the colony and actually that's also killing the poor bees. Think about the climate change. A lot of, of the things that we knew that will happen today, higher temperatures, how many times we hear that this year will be hotter than, than previous years, right? Seems like the tendency is like every year is more hot than the previous years. So things like that, the rain season patterns, they are changing. And sometimes it's snowing where it shouldn't be snowing, or it's hot where it shouldn't be hot, right? But these extreme climate changes, of course, has a repercussion with the animals, with any species, even with us. And of course, pollinators will be one of the most affected ones because they are very sensible. Actually, point one and three, so the industrial agriculture as well as the climate change are the main drivers that suddenly, the bees, you will see that they will start reallocating their hives because they need somehow to survive and they need to somehow accommodate. If here is being too cold, they will move to places where it's more warm. And you will expect, or actually, they will put their hives in the place that you least expect, which actually could be your garden. But what can you do as individual to prevent the bee mortality? Well, I bring you three options that they are very simple. One of them to follow is to avoid harm to pollinators. There are organizations who actually are fighting against the use of uh, harming pesticides. So I would ask you to support those initiatives if you can. The second one is to promote an ecological farming, right? There are a lot of in either individuals or companies who actually, um, they are trying to do agriculture without insecticides and pesticides and actually it's working. So I invite you really to go through that ecological um, way. And the third one is to, do a, to adopt a bee action plan. What I mean with that? Well, during this time of the year, during spring and summer, you will notice that it's getting very hot and suddenly you decide to go to your backyard or enjoy just in your balcony and you're staring at your swing and you have this beautiful image, right? You have some options to act. I just mentioned two. One of them would be to get crazy and decide to kill the bees, right? But I wouldn't recommend that. They could react in an aggressive way, so don't do that, please. Besides that, who wants to kill bees, right? And if you're not aware, at least in Germany, there is a law 
that you have to pay 500 euros per bee that you kill. So imagine if there are like 5,000 bees at least there, so that fine will be quite expensive. And I hope it's not top, so that you will pay 2.5 uh, 2, 2 millions for killing those bees. The second alternative, which I recommend, is actually have a look into the hotel, bee hotels and also bee keepers that could be on your area. But probably you will be wondering, Vianney, where I can find those uh, bee hotels or bee keepers around my area? Are there any, right? I don't even know if this is a bee or this is a wasp. I don't have an idea, right? And let's remember, there are about like 2,000 different uh, bees types. So it's kind of hard to, uh, to see in which side we are. Well, for that, I have developed a solution in Alteryx and I'm going to show it to you right now. want to make sure that you are seeing what I want. Perfect. So um, let's say that uh, as a user of this solution, what you're going to do, you will go to the web page that it's inside of Alteryx, this, uh, Alteryx server. And from there, you can find an application regarding to this pro problem. In this case, will be Save the Bees app. Right. You can click Run. And inside of this application, you will find a set of questions. By the way, you can run this directly from your phone or from your smartphone. Right? The idea is that you can have it available uh, and you can run it on demand. So what this application is asking me, there are three simple questions. One of them is select and be image. Let's say I'm staring at my swing. I take a picture. I have it here. Actually, I'm going to select or you can upload it directly from your phone. Later on, I'm going to type my address. You will know where I live in Munich. So. Um, So this is my address. I'm going to give also my uh, zip code as well as the city. And it's asking me for the country, which in this case is, uh, if I can type correctly. OK, Germany. And I'm going to execute this workflow or this application. What this um, workflow, what it's actually doing, it's going to execute it's not my computer. So what it's going to do, it will take all the information that I give, so these three inputs, it will find from the image, will say, okay, which type of bee it is, if it's a bee at all. And as well, it will give me information about beekeepers and bee hotels around my area. Would be great to get at least 10 beekeepers, just in case some of them are on holidays or I would like to contact them, then that would be the, uh, the case. So as you can see, this is the output, right? Here is telling me that this bee that I just uploaded is an Italian honey bee. Right? I also get a map, and this map you can see, as I mentioned, I live in Munich, so this is um, the place where I live. And then here you can identify all the beekeepers and bee hotels around this area. And at the end, it's also providing me a table, and within this table, I get the contact details of all these beekeepers ranked on the distance. So for example, I would get um, that the closest one is four kilometers from my uh, address. So I can directly contact them, tell them I have a hive of Italian honeybees. Can you help me to reallocate them from my backyard? So question for all of you, who is interested to have a look into uh, how I build that with Alteryx? Ah, that's great. Well, in any case, if you say no, I have still 20 minutes and I will show it to you, okay? So that's great. Let's see how actually we're saving the bees. Let me go now to Alteryx. And what you're seeing here is actually Alteryx Designer. Within Alteryx Designer, it's possible that you can build a workflow, which at the end is nothing else than a traceable visual process. And then behind this application, it's possible that you can have a look into what we did. Right? For that, I'm going to connect to the server where I upload this um, application. I go to File, then I said Open Workflow, then I go to the Tableau conference, which is this one. I can select the application I want to open. And this, what I am showing you, is actually a very good way for me to collaborate with end users, with my citizen data scientists, and also even my data scientists. Right? 
Let me just execute that, that you can see how actually this workflow is uh, working. What you're seeing here in the upper part, yeah, um, how it works is here on my canvas, I will drag and drop these um, icons that you see here that are nothing else than functionalities that would allow me to create my process, my workflow. And also by doing that, um, I will document the process. So nothing is hidden here. Right? As long as you are using all these functionalities, automatically you will be documenting all this process so that other teams can also make use of uh, the analysis that you built. So let's have a look high level. If the time allows, I can go deeper. And if not, you can find us in the Alteryx booth for more details. So what you have is on the left-hand side, you will see the inputs. On the right-hand side, you will see the outputs. In the, min, uh, in the middle, so all these colors, what you are going to see is you are doing several advanced analytics steps. And I want you to keep in mind that there are different types that you can perform inside of Alteryx, but more important, right, is how you can orchestrate all these different types of analysis within a visual, intuitive process workflow that you are seeing here. OK, now let's go a little bit deeper here. Let me just zoom in into this area. And let me just show you what we have here. So what we have here is first the user inputs. Right, as a user input, I have the user address that I show you, that, that you saw it previously, how I was using the uh, application. I also have the B image, and as well, I have a, a B dictionary. This B dictionary will help me to identify an ID to correlate, okay, this ID belongs, for example, to the Italian honeybee. This is from the side of the inputs. Now let's move to the outputs. And inside of the outputs, well, you saw it some minutes ago. I show you the report. This report will contain all the information combined, so the name, the image, the map, and also the list of all the beekeepers. And of course, we are at Tableau Conference, and we are strong partners, so you will see here that uh, it is possible to export directly to Tableau, that it will refresh your uh, interactive dashboards with this information, if that's what you decide to do. OK? So let me go. One step here. So what you're doing, you are um, you are geocoding on the fly. What means is you are converting this address that you just typed into a point on a map, and this point on a map will help you to locate where the user it is. With this information, later I can do some geospatial analysis that will allow me to say, okay, I want that you find the nearest ten beekeepers or hotels to that point. And at the same time, I want that parallel. You have a look into, let's say here, probably you don't see that, it's too small, yeah, uh, 500 kilometers, right? In case there is nothing in my area, I want to give another possibility that within 500 kilometers, you can find uh, anything doing a spatial match. If you are interested in to, more, uh, to know more about all the spatial capabilities that Alteryx has, I invite you to go to the boot and then we can discuss further. With that information, actually what I'm doing, uh, uh, in parallel, here down, what I'm doing is reading the image that the user just uploaded to find out which type of uh, bee it is. And then what I'm doing is I'm converting this image, which actually is the non-structured file, right? And I'm converting into um, a long text, which actually is a typical task that you do when you are doing some image classification. So this is you want to see it as a classical or standard procedure that you do before you do all the classification. So this is this, this part. With this information, what I'm going to get is a list of the beekeepers right, that I now I can analyze. I have identified which type of bee it is. I can combine that with the database that I have to check, OK, this is an Italian honey bee. And with this information, I can combine it into a report, as you saw it, and finally, for example, in this case, if I have a look into the output, let me just show you this window. Right, it's the same that you saw, where I have the Italian honeybee, the image, again, the map, and the list of the beekeepers and hotels that I can contact. Right. 
And as I mentioned, if you would like to, again, export that information to Tableau, you can do it without problems. We have um, uh, ways to do that. OK. So as you can see, if, if I have a look here in the upper part, that's something interesting I want to show you, right? is that you can do this interactive. And you saw it already, right? You, I show you already the application. And that application, what is giving you is the possibility to add interactivity so that any user can uh, use your analysis um, executed on demand. And in this way, you have created a web interface that it's um, um, a very good example of how you can put in production something that maybe looks like, OK, I'm using machine learning. I'm using spatial analytics, right? How you put that into production? Well, this is a perfect example of how about combining some tools, drag and drop, five minutes of doing that, you can put it into production. And actually, if you are looking for something go to market that it's really fast, this is a very good option to do that. OK, so how is the time? I have still some time. So let me go one level, um, still inside, for the people who are interested to know a little bit more about what is inside of all of this and all, all these um, sections. So the first step, um, or let me do a parenthesis, what you see on the left-hand side is your configuration window. right? And then here on the lower one is the results window or the preview data. So essentially, you can see data there at the end, right? the results of your analysis. So um, this first step of all this process, let us go here. Let me do a little bit of zoom. Right? It's actually geocode the address. Right? I'm inputting data or an address, not by putting latitude and longitude, but actually by giving an address like, uh, for example, the place where I live. Or I could give, I don't know what is the address here, Sonen, Ale, something. But yeah. yeah. So it really depends on the information that I'm giving. Internally, I'm having two geocoders, one for UK and one for Europe. And it would really depend on the information that you are inputting. It would choose one or another. Depends where is the address located. And with that information, what I'm just doing is here uh, locating this, um, uh, the user on a map. I'm giving it a point to put it on a map. With that information, I can use special capabilities that would allow me to say, OK, fine, within this point, the nearest 10 beekeepers that are around 100 kilometers. I can extend this distance or lower this distance, depends on my needs. right? In parallel, as I mentioned, as I don't know if here I will get any result, I'm doing an analysis of doing a trade area of 500 kilometers that would allow me to make a special match with my database to understand if there is something around between the point of the address of the user and, um, and the databases, there is something around. I want to give alternatives. As you can see, this is actually what generates our two inputs. And with Alteryx, it's easy to actually from there filter out which information I want using matching data, formulas, or filters that would allow me to say, OK, what is the appropriate that I will give to the user? Right? In case there is nothing, obviously, we'll take the 500 kilometers. If there is something around this area, I will take the 10 users. Right? Here on the lower part, I mentioned that it comes the part, the, um, um, the deep learning and artificial intelligence part. Right? Here, what I have is a B image. And inside of this image, I have nothing else than just um, uploaded an image. Right? I have a path where you can find that image. Right. This path, as I mentioned, a typical process for doing image classification would be actually to transform that image into a large text that is uh, stored in the blob storage and sending that to, in this case, my neural network model. What I have here in my Python tool right, is nothing else than a um, neural network model that I already pre-trained. And this pre-train would allow me to identify, well, different types of, um, of the bees. Right? So in, essentially, what this model is doing is just scoring. Right? So I, I did a, a previous work before. On parallel, right, if you're working with your data science team and they would like to put in production one of the models that you have there, you have the possibility to do that with Promote. And you can easily call this model that you have created via third-party tools. And these third-party tools would allow you to put in instant, would be really like, 
uh, seconds to put in production one of the models that you have created and not just store it into, okay, model version one, let's see when I will use it, right? Put it really into production in the business. In my case, to save the bees. Okay, the result what I get from this beautiful model, right, is um, actually an ID that will help me to identify. And as I have a dictionary of the bees, I can identify directly, do a simple join that will help me to say, okay, this is the bee that I'm looking for, right? Could be um, a Mexican bee, right? Whatever bee that you find here around. Something important to mention is that even though this part, right? I'm sure you, you came because the part of deep learning, machine learning, artificial intelligence, it's a sexy world, word and world as well, right? So everyone is interested into that part. But as you can see, this is just a small part. And even though it's, it could be the most complicated part of all the process, but it's just a part of all the process that I'm orchestrating here in Altrix, right? I want you that you visualize this as the possibility of having different parts and having all together for you to uh, be able to put in production um, something that you would like to apply in the business. Finally, as I mentioned, here from here I get the ID, which at the end is matched to identify the real B that I have here. And combining this information together with the uh, beekeepers and hotels, then I can make use of our dynamic reporting capabilities to actually make it in a very visual way and give information to the end user, okay, where you should be calling to these uh, people. Okay, so let me just um, recap a little bit what we have done. So I need to go out from here. And let me go to presentation mode. On the left hand side, you have the data that you ingested. On the right hand side, you have the outputs. In between, you are doing several processings. You are addressing geocoding analysis on the fly. You are also performing spatial analytics. In parallel, you are also doing deep learning and artificial intelligence with the help of um, TensorFlow and Keras, which is the case. And finally, you are combining all that information to have a visual report that at the end, you can automate and put in production thanks to Alteric server that will allow you to put and give the capability to end users to make use of the application that you just built. So going a little bit um, in, into the area of helping, right? I want to introduce you to Alteryx for Good. Actually, Alteryx for Good is our way, Alteryx, uh, sorry, it's our way, Alteryx, to, to say thank you and to contribute to the community. How we do that? Well, we give the possibility um, of generating and helping the next generation of data scientists and also analysts to make use of tools like Altrix to uh, have the skills that they need to, um, to work, not, not only to work, right, but also to solve important problems that nowadays we are facing, right? So for that, if for example, uh, I had already the chance to talk with some students and also with some non-governmental uh, uh, organizations, but if you are in that area, yeah, if you're a student, if you're a professor, or if you belong to a non-profit organization, I invite you to go to the boot of Altrix. It's the one, the, the one that has a big screen, just in the middle of there. You can go there, ask us for how we can work together to actually solve uh, interesting problems that you might be facing while working with data. And with that, as I mentioned, I invite you to go to the Altrix boot and um, also to get the hands -on, your hands-on with our products. At this point, I want to thank you for, for your time and also your attention. And the Q&A session is open for any other questions that you have. Thank you.